Hello, welcome to your lecture on generalized anxiety disorder. During this lecture, we're mostly going to focus on just generalized anxiety disorder, which is GAD. Now, in the past, it's also included OCD, which is with the DSM-5 as has moved out. It also included uh, PTSD, which now has its own category as well. So our big focus here is primary care and generalized anxiety disorder. And this is actually a relatively common uh, reason for patients to seek primary care. It's sometimes hard to understand the epidemiology because there are a lot of sources that say it's the most common psychiatric disorder that we see in primary care. But then most sources will say that only about 10% of those with generalized anxiety disorder have it alone. So usually it's comorbidity with depression or another psychiatric um, problem. Now this has a big impact on patients. They experience excessive chronic anxiety and worry, and this can be about events or activities. Lots of times it's about health, um, health of family members, significant others, a work and finances. And it's rare that the patient comes in who has a lot of insight into the fact that this is an, an anxiety disorder. Sorry, that's kind of hard to say. So lots of times they come in with this large amount of symptoms that kind of don't seem to match up. Fatigue, muscle tension, restlessness, all of those kinds of things tend to exhibit themselves with anxiety disorders. So sometimes this can be a tough diagnosis to make. So we're gonna talk about the correct um, questions to ask. When it comes to epidemiology, it is very common in primary care. It has a 12-month prevalence rate of 3.1% in the population. And, you know, up to 8% of patients who visit primary care offices. It's pretty common to have this sometime in your life. And the predominant age is uh, persons 45 to 49 years of age. It gets a lot less prevalent as we get older. So over the age of 60, it's actually pretty rare. So I guess we just learned to chill. Women are twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder over their lifetime. And again, lots of times we wonder about this and whether it's just females who are more likely to seek care. But as far as our epidemiology, it's definitely female greater to male. We have been able to identify some risk factors, of course female, which I don't have it on this slide, but that's important. Caucasian race, adverse life events, including medical illness, disability, or unemployment. If there's a family history of anxiety, then it also plays a part. As you know, that this, there's a lot of genetic information related to mental health disorders. A lack of social support, so those that are single, divorced, uh, living alone are more likely to have problems. Increase in stress, and again, that goes with uh, any type of adverse life events. Sometimes stress can be something good that happens, but it still produces the same amount of stress. So uh, it can be good or bad, it's just changes. Of course, there's a comorbidity with depression that I've been talking about. It's, sometimes this is just a really hard diagnosis because we all have anxiety. And so, you know, when does it get to be where it crosses the line into something that needs to be treated? And, you know, that happens when we start to get impairment. And lots of times it happens when we start to have all these somatic symptoms with the fatigue and insomnia and all the things that go with it that cause us to seek treatment. Now, so today, or in this presentation, we're going to talk mostly about generalized anxiety disorder. There's a few things that can kind of go along with it. A panic disorder. Uh, it's not a standalone diagnosis. It's an abrupt surge of intense fear or discomfort that reaches a peak within minutes and contains at least four of the following. Palpitation, sweating, trembling, uh, shortness of air, choking, chest pain, nausea, dizziness, chills, or heat sensations, 
uh, feelings of numbness or tingling in their extremities, uh, fear of going crazy, fear of dying. Now these aren't usually the people who are going to show up in your office. Lots of times these people really do feel like that they are having a heart attack or that they're dying and so lots of times they will go to the emergency department. Now when they're in that type of panic it may be appropriate to give a benzodiazepine but we're going to talk about other sources of controlling their anxiety when it comes to the presentation that we're going to see in primary care. So they're probably not going to come in to see you in this panic disorder. Now they will come in and see you and tell you I've had recent visits to the emergency department uh, and they feel like that it's anxiety and that I need to follow up. So that will happen. But most of the time you're really not going to have a need to give a benzo. Now we all know about phobias, marked fear or anxiety about a specific object or situation. That situation always invokes symptoms. Um, it can go on for a long period of time and you know it's out of proportion to the actual danger. Social anxiety is actually pretty common. It's marked fear anxiety about one or more social situations. They tend to have a fear of humiliation. They have uh, symptoms in social situations and it's kind of the same symptoms over and over and again that's lasting six months or longer. So these are just some other manifestations of anxiety besides what we see with generalized anxiety. So this is our DSM-5. This is how we make our diagnosis for generalized anxiety disorder. Excessive anxiety and worry occurring more days than not for at least six months about a number of events or activities such as work or school. The individual finds it difficult to control the worry. The anxiety and worry are associated with three or more of the following six symptoms. Only one item is required in children. A restless or keyed up, feeling on edge, a being easily fatigued, a difficulty concentrating or mind just going blank, irritability, uh, muscle tension, or sleep disturbance. So that can be insomnia or more likely hypersomnia. And that comes from being fatigued, being kind of on the edge all the time, and then being fatigued from that. Symptoms cause clinically significant distress or impairment in functioning. And of course, it's not attributable to a substance or better explained by another disorder. Somatic symptoms, which are just physical symptoms of what's going on, is, is the most common with generalized anxiety disorder. I mean, this is really common with depression, but lots of times they can also say, I'm not interested in activities, um, I feel sad, those sorts of things. With anxiety, they seem to be a little bit less keyed in to that's what's going on. And your body just starts to react to that. And a lot of it is the fight and flight and just kind of the being on edge. Um, they have a lot of fatigue and again that's a little bit like when you have hyperthyroidism and that your body is so revved up that eventually you just kind of crash and have fatigue. Insomnia is common. Uh, sleep cycle just abnormality is common. Diaphoresis we think of more with panic disorder. So remember this is on a scale with panic disorder being at one end uh, normal anxiety that we all have being on the other end and then generalized anxiety disorder being somewhere around six or seven and starting to impact their function is kind of how I think about it. The neural symptoms, dizziness, restlessness, um, parathesis like um, numbness and tingling that usually comes with a hyperventilation that they have with uh, panic disorder. The same chest pain palpitations, again, moving more along the continuum of the panic disorder. Um, GI, diarrhea, uh, dry mouth, nausea and vomiting. Um, GI, I think, is one of the first things that kicks in, especially for me. Um, I remember that very well from my PhD days. So that's kind of one of my first realizations that I'm a little bit stressed. A urinary urgency and frequency, again, you know, things mostly revved up. So when the patient comes in and things really don't match, they've got a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and um, then it starts to kind of key you in that um, 
this is something that you need to think about. When it comes to subjective data, remember that this is a diagnosis that you're really going to have to kind of tease out. Their symptoms are usually uh, very general, they're very nonspecific, um, they're tired, and they're related to, you know, lots of different uh, body areas. They're usually unable to identify a specific area of concern. They may be able to identify a life trigger, like, you know, they started a job recently and they don't feel like they're doing well. That's a life trigger, but most likely they're going to state that they've always been warriors. So you're looking for that long-term thing greater than six months to, to give them a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. The other thing about the diagnosis is they need, it needs to be affecting their life in a negative way. So you need to inquire about, you know, how this is affecting their life and those sorts of things. Inquire about self-medicating. This is a pretty common thing for people with anxiety disorders to um, self-medicate in some way. Lots of times you're going to notice that these people are smokers. You know, um, cigarettes are a great drug. They kind of pick you up and calm you down at the same time. So there's a lot of self-medicating. Not that I'm promoting smoking, but I'm just saying it's, it's kind of a unique thing and it seems to help. So Inquire also about suicidal ideation, so don't forget about that. Don't forget about your uh, comorbidities. Uh, there is some um, research that shows that we should ask about suicidal ideation in generalized anxiety disorder, as well as depression. Objective data. You know, this is all going to be guided by the symptoms that they present with. If it's a younger person, you know, if it's a young female in her 20s, then you have a lot less to worry about. Whereas if it's an older person who comes in with these kinds of symptoms, you know, you always have to be worried about is there some medical cause that's kind of driving this anxiety. Another thing is, you know, if someone comes in with physical symptoms and you don't do a good exam and you just say, you know, I think this is anxiety, they're really not going to buy into it. So you kind of have to go into this very slowly with them and you know address the physical things i understand that you're having problems with this but i'm not hearing any abnormalities with your heart etc so you have to address those you can't just blow them off now at the same time you don't want to do a million dollar workup when you're starting to get a really good feel that this is generalized anxiety disorder so we're going to talk in a few minutes about some skills that we can use that will hopefully help you be sure that this is generalized anxiety disorder, and also hopefully key your patient in a little bit more. Now when it comes to possible medical causes, these are kind of differentials, I guess, for anxiety. You know, cardiovascular, what are all the things in, that would cause your heart to race? You know, your atrial fib, your sinus tac, palpitations, all those kinds of things. Always ask if they're taking any new medications, over-the-counter medications. Um, you know, you think about uh, fatigue and palpitations and hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Uh, we always think about in this population, especially these young females, that we always have to think about hyperthyroidism. So that's something that you're definitely going to want to check as well. Uh, when fatigue, sorry, when fatigue is the presenting symptom, you know, you always worry about anemia. Again, this may be uh, a woman in her early 40s who's starting to be kind of perimenopausal who's having um, heavy menses at this particular time. So all of these things you kind of have to think about. Now you're probably going to know those kinds of things just from your nursing background. But don't think just because it's a mental health exam that I'm giving you that I wouldn't give you something like atrial fib, you know, if I walked you into that. So as you start to think about how this patient might present and what some of the physical symptoms might be. If you don't have a pretty good grasp on that, things like hyperthyroidism, then you know just go ahead and kind of look that up as you go through. So again, just talking a little bit more about our differential diagnosis. 
Other psychiatric disorders, of course, is extremely important to rule out. This is a very common comorbidity with depression. Um, another thing that you need to probably think about is bipolar disorder. You know, if they are fatigued and not sleeping, on edge, irritable, you know, maybe we're dealing with a bipolar disorder that maybe hasn't been diagnosed. Uh, we talked about cardiovascular, you know, if, if chest pain is the main presenting symptom, then of course you want to do an EKG. You know, you want to make sure that everything is okay. Who knows what hasn't been diagnosed in the past that may be there as well. And the same with respiratory. I mean, if the main thing that they come in with is respiratory, you know, you want to do a pretty good workup of that. Um, and I'll give you a prime example of this. I was following a student at a clinic one time, and um, it was a follow-up for generalized anxiety disorder. And a young girl had been placed on Zoloft for generalized anxiety disorder. And her main primary problem was respiratory, where she was getting really short of breath. And when she was getting really short of breath was right after she smoked a cigarette. Well, as I've kind of talked a little bit about with this generalized anxiety disorder, um, usually cigarettes make them feel a whole lot better. But with her, that was causing her increased shortness of air. And she really wasn't having that increased shortness of air with at other times. So it kind of didn't add up. I mean, it kind of, to me, sounded a lot like an, um, maybe some asthma that hadn't been diagnosed in the past. And so needless to say, the Zoloft really wasn't helping her that much uh, because I don't think that was the primary problem. So those are all the things that you have to kind of think about as you're going through your differential diagnosis. When it comes to diagnostics, um, again, we want to be inclusive without being excessive, which is which can be tough. There's a couple anxiety scales. Um, I kind of think about the GAD2 a lot like the PHQ2 with depression. So you ask a couple questions and then if it turns out that that's positive, then you move on to a more detailed type of screen. So you can ask a couple questions. Over the past two weeks, how often have you been bothered by the following problems? Feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge, being unable to stop or control, worrying. And then they give them a uh, list of things like zero is not at all, one is several days, um, two is more than one half of all days, and then three is nearly every day. So if they get a three on this, then you know that you need to move on. The Hamilton Anxiety Scale, I guess, is considered to be the gold standard. I don't know that they have like a true gold standard like we do with some other things, but it's the most uh, validated tool that we have. It's a little bit longer. So I don't know if you want, would want to start with it. I would probably do the two question screen and then move on to the more detailed. Now we talked about TSH and I think that's incredibly important. Again, think about your CBC if fatigue is your uh, main presenting problem. Uh, EKG if they are saying that they have chest pain. And remember that usually the younger the age, the more the less we can uh, do diagnostics. It really helps us limit them. When it comes to management and referral for anxiety disorders, lots of times we will start with some medication. Although it's not as effective as cognitive behavioral therapy has shown to be. But usually in primary care, our first go-to is going to be an antidepressant, and that's going to be an SSRI. Some people use uh, Nessar NI as first line, but um, they're usually more expensive. And they're really, when they've looked at all the different ones together and compared them, they've been about the same efficacy. So, you know, look for something that your patient will tolerate well, that will work well, and that's less expensive, is, is what I would say. Um, the other thing I would say is stay away from benzos. I mean, they benzodiazepines, as I keep saying benzos, I assume that you know what I mean with that. They're extremely addictive. And uh, once your patient starts taking those, it's really hard to get them to switch over to an antidepressant. The benzodiazepines work really well. 
And because of that, the patient often doesn't want to then switch over to something. And we really need to not have them on benzodiazepines for long periods of time. For one reason is that the benzodiazepines tend to increase depression. And we know that this is a very common comorbidity with anxiety. So just to put them on a benzodiazepine and leave them on it is, is not good management. I think, you know, myself, the only role that benzos play are when they're in a panic. Um, and I think most of the time that's gonna happen in the ER. So your role really is to think long-term for the particular patients. And even though an SSRI may take a couple weeks to really kick in and start making a difference, you know, there are other things that you could do to kind of help them out while the SSRI is kicking in. Um, you could think about a beta blocker, which works really well. You can also think about an antihistamine, and that may help with the uh, immediate symptoms until your antidepressant really starts to go. Now, you need to think about uh, psychotherapy, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, CBT, because all the research has shown that it's more effective for generalized anxiety disorder than the antidepressants. And it's more effective in the long term with the studies that they've done. Um, a lot of the new studies are looking at mindfulness uh, just to help control the anxiety. And, and that's, that's really interesting reading if you have time to, to take a look at that. Exercise is also, just like depression, uh, excellent for anxiety disorder. There's lots of different exercises they've looked at. Uh, yoga and Tai Chi are probably the most common that they've looked at, but we also know that uh, aerobic exercise will help with anxiety as well. That's also very interesting reading if you have time to take a look at that. You know, anytime that you can offer your patient uh, lifestyle changes as opposed to medications, then you should consider doing that and always inform them that uh, these other therapies have shown to be extremely effective or as effective as the medication that you're giving them so that they understand that they have options.